Welcome to another Food Plotters Journal podcast. I'm Randy Vanderveen of Strategic Habitat, and in this episode, I'm joined by my co-host, John Comp of Northwoods Whitetail Food Plot Seed Company, to talk about opening up the overhead canopy in a mature woods, what you can do to help your oak trees produce more acorns, the power of cereal rye grain in your food plots this time of year, and John explains why you don't want to mix different types of clovers in a plow down blend. So let's get right into the call with John. Hey John, how you doing? Good Randy, how are you? Hey, real good. So here we are, mid-March, and uh, well, it's actually I think the first day of spring today, if I'm not mistaken. So how are things looking up in the UP of Michigan? Uh, really good. We're ahead of schedule. We've got uh, rain today. A lot of the snow is gone. It's still pretty thick in the woods yet, uh, probably a foot of snow in the woods yet, but our uh, lawn's starting to green up. Our food plots are starting to get filled with deer. I'm I'm happy to see uh, the snow going quick. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I had a client that lives down in my neck of the woods in southern Michigan, and uh, he told me on Saturday that he was going north to go snowmobiling. <laughs> They're going to have so, to go really far north. <laughs> There's not yeah, much left yeah. up there. Yep. <laughs> I think he's actually going up to the Keweenaw Peninsula. So, yeah, it's way up there. Yeah, but, I'm uh, sure so, still up there. Yeah. So you still have a little bit in the woods, huh? Yeah, we were. We just did our first uh, first of the year trip into the woods this uh, past weekend. Uh, Frosty did some switchgrass and then walked around um, just to see how a lot of our habitat work from last year did. And it was it looked really nice, but yeah, it was, it was kind of difficult walking because you'd break through and, in uh, you know, you'd be in water up to your, up to your shin mm-hmm. and, and then you'd walk a little bit. And yeah, there was about a foot, foot and a half of snow. Uh, unfortunately, we did find a really nice two-year-old eight pointer uh, near one of our deer stands that uh, I hadn't been in since probably Halloween. It was a really good bow stand in the staging area. And right underneath the stand, there was a really nice two-year-old eight-pointer that uh, I, I looked. I couldn't find uh, any any bullet, you know, where the rib rib cage is. I didn't find any bullet holes. So, uh, yeah, who knows what happened to it? I'm assuming we had quite a few problems with neighbors this year, wounding deer and, and then calling for permission. And uh, I think the count, the, the the last time I can remember, the count was up to four. Uh, so, um you know, and, and unfortunately, that's probably never shot. But uh, you hate to find him that way, and uh, you know, it's just it's just part of the deal, I guess. But um, other than that, uh, I was surprised with all the the rubs and scrapes and stuff we found. It's pretty cool. Okay, yeah, man, that's a shame, huh? I tell you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. So, mm-hmm. so, so you got uh, deer on your food plot now behind your house, finally. Yep the 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 herd's starting to show back up. You know, it, it was uh, just two weeks ago we had, uh, it was under, you know, complete snow. And uh, I think we're about 60% uncovered and things are starting to green up and they're in there. So, um, you know, good things are happening up here. I'm waiting for uh, all the snow to get out of here and fire up a chainsaw. And then right after that, a tractor. So that's what we're doing up here. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Cool. So what have you been up to? Well, this week I've spent about uh, three full days on a property down south, about 10 hours uh, south of Michigan. And, okay. it, you know, the difference between even southern Michigan and, and what's going on down there is, you know, everything's green and up. Grass is green. Uh, maple maple trees are really budding out big time. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some of, the, some of the bushes in the woods, you know, some of that forbs and stuff are already leafing out, out down there. And it's just amazing, you know, when when you when you open up the sky or open up the uh, the canopy to the sky mm-hmm. in the woods, the amount of regrowth that just takes place with just forbs and and briars and thistles and and all that stuff is just amazing. What happens in one year compared to what we're kind of used to in Michigan? Mm-hmm. Their their growing season is just so much uh, longer. So this landowner, and this is something that you know I, I really don't hear a lot of guys talk about, you know, why they have so many does on their property and they don't really see the bucks um, until the rut. And, you know, th- this guy is a classic case and, and he knew it, you know, and basically when we start talking about it and I walked the property with him, 
it, it basically kind of confirmed what he was thinking. So his issue, which we had to fix, was he, he has very little bedding cover on the property, but he's got, you know, he's kind of in an agricultural area. He's got just tons of food, very little cover. And, and so when he accesses his stands, you know, the deer are seeing him from, from way out, you know, so they can be, they can be a hundred yards in the woods and they can see him walking a hundred yards out in the field. You know, it's just, it's right. pretty ridiculous. So anyway, we did a lot of uh, edge feathering and um, on the habitat plan I created for him, I eliminated about 75% of his food in the ag fields, which he was totally fine with. And, uh, you know, that's pretty rare. A lot of landowners are not going to want to do that, you know. But uh, he, he understands that it's not about the quantity of food, but it's really about the type of food, the quality of food, and then where it's positioned and, you know, how it relates to his access and his hunger. So we eliminated the food, increased bedding, and, uh, you know, going to move some blinds and stands around. So I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to help him tremendously, even just in year one. So great landowner. And John, he already bought a 50-pound bag of swift grass from you. Okay. And uh, <laughs> he's going to have to buy more because, boy, he's got, I bet you he's got almost 40 acres of switch grass to plant. That's pretty he's, cool. Uh, yeah, we're, we're sending a lot of that out. And I, I thought I remember who you're talking about, and he had said he was working with you. So, yeah, that, that's pretty neat. He's got a lot of resources at his fingertips that he can, you know, he can buy any piece of equipment he wanted to. But what he's doing is he's just going to rent a drill instead of buying okay. one. Yep. And, you know, I think that, that really is an option that I think a lot of guys have um, that, that I think some guys don't even really think about is the fact that, you know, you, sometimes your local extension office or even a feed mill, you know, if you buy a bunch of uh, feed from them, you know, they'll mm -hmm. let you rent their, their gravity wagon for spreading egg line or, you know, a cedar. Or, or maybe just, uh, you know, rent a drill to you for a pretty cheap price. So, you know, instead of having to go out and buy all this big equipment when you're only going to use it like once or twice a year, you know, renting is a is just a great option. And it allows you to, you know, go no-till. You can go now and the drills are just a wonderful thing, especially, you know, for planting switchgrass like that. Yeah, even here in Menominee, I believe there's a, a no-till drill rental. And I think like most places, they charge by the acre. There's a calibration unit on it. And they charge per acre. You know, it's not by the day, by the hour, the week. I, I believe it's by the acre. But yeah, that's a really cheap way to to get into the no-till, uh, or especially if you can't frost seed switchgrass. And that's a lot of recommendations. I mean, there's very few places where we sent a lot of switchgrass out to the western Wisconsin, Minnesota area this week, and they can still frost seed. But you know, I, I would think after this. Uh, this coming weekend and, and late next week, I, I think we're probably one of the few areas in the, in the whitetail range that people can still frost seed. But one of the recommendations we, we make to folks is to go rent a drill through their county extension. And, you know, it, it, I would assume it's going to be depending on what horse pa uh, horsepower tractor you have, the experience you have. And they might even have uh, a service where they run the drill for you. And you just again pay them by the acre. So, uh, and it's it's a case by case situation where you know one county might have a this type of drill, this county might have uh, a drill and a tractor available. But yeah, by all means, if you're really not interested in buying a no till drill, renting one is there's got to be a place within 50 miles of where just about anybody lives where you can rent a no till drill. Yeah, exactly. He's got a a three. He's got a Genesis three. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to, for as much switch grass as he needs to plant, that's going to take him you yeah. know, way too long. So he's oh, just going to use one thing. Yeah, right. I mean, he could easily go out and buy it. He said, I can go out and get a Genesis 8. But, you know, he says, man, I, I really don't need it that much. I just can't justify it, you know. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting, John. We, um, we, you know, when we walked out there the very first day, the first day I was there, we must have bumped about, you know, 15 deer. And they just ran and ran and ran all the way across to the neighbor's property. And uh, we went there with our saws and whatnot. We started, you know, hinge cutting, opening up the canopy. We put a lot of maple trees down and a lot of buds, right? And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> he, put up a, he put up a trail cam. And, you know, within about three, four hours after we were gone, you know, they were already in there. 
he was getting pictures on his phone already. But uh, the second day we walked in there, uh, the deer were, were back again, basically in the same bedding area. And this time they didn't run off the property. They ran to the opposite corner where the bedding was and they just kind of hung up there. And, uh, you know, so yeah, just, uh, just something that, you know, man, if you don't have the cover, the deer are just going to keep right on running until they do run into right. cover, you know, for those folks that have a big wide open woods where they can see two to 300 yards, you know, through the woods at this time of year, boy, there's nothing like uh, putting a bunch of timber on the ground and creating cover, food and security. So Make your food plots last longer too, right? Yeah, I would think so. You know, Randy, when you guys are doing all that hinge cutting, now you talked about doing maples, okay? And there's folks that that think putting oak trees on the ground is taboo. They, they, you know, oh my God, that's all that master. I, what do you? Uh, what's your opinion on putting oaks on the ground? So if you have too many oaks, or let's say you, you have just so many trees on your property, whether it's oaks and maples, you got poplars and maybe some cherries, hickories. I mean, mm-hmm. if there's just way too much canopy and there's not a whole mm-hmm. lot of sunlight reaching the forest floor, you know, it, you really have to open up that canopy to allow sunlight and to help some of these oaks produce mass. Because if, mm-hmm. if it's like brassicas, you know, if you plant brassicas way too heavy and they're too close mm-hmm. to each other, they don't like that competition. And you're going to get very, very small bulbs. And so it's the same mm-hmm. thing with oak trees. If they're all starving for nutrients, they're all starving for sunlight, um, they're just not going to produce the acorns as if you took out, you know, whatever the percentage is, if you took out a third or 50% of them, you know, the ones that are left are going to produce more acorns than than all of them put together. So right. I know some guys talk about, you know, boy, should I fertilize my my oak trees? Should I put lime down around my oak trees? And yeah, you can do that. But if you don't take out the canopy first and you don't give them sunlight first, you you know, that fertilizer and lime and whatever you put down on the ground is really not going to help anyway. You're just dumping money on the ground. So if you had it, let's say you had an acre and and I already know what my answer is, but let's say you've got people out there that are thinking about this and they're, they're torn between the, you know, the quote unquote oak savanna or these oaks produce X amount of deer food. Okay. Let's say you had a, an acre and there was, uh, well, let's say 15 oak trees. Okay. Whether it's red, white, my opinion would be I would see I would be happy to see ten on the ground and those other five producing and producing a lot more oak, plus you've got all that cover on the ground, plus all the other stuff that's gonna grow up versus yep. you know, fifteen oak trees and it's dark as can be underneath all those oak trees. I'd rather see ten yep. of them on the ground, the five spaced out, and then all, all that food that's coming up. What, what, what's your opinion? Yeah, I'm I'm totally with you, John. And you know, a lot of it depends on how big these trees are, um, what, mm-hmm. you know, what the what the competition is like, how close they're spaced, and all that. And generally, you know, the the formula is for every inch of diameter you have on a tree, that's how many feet you want spacing between trees. So if you got a tree that's you know 10 inches in diameter, you want at least right. you know 10 feet in, in spacing. Is that for board foot? Is that for foot or board feet production, or is that a habitat? That's interesting. I've never heard that before. I think that's a that's a pretty interesting number. Well, yeah, that that was something that I picked up from a forester when I was out in the woods with him one day. And you know, he says mm-hmm. if you want if you want healthy trees that are going to and, and this is from a monetary standpoint. So you know, if you're trying okay. to grow trees okay. for timber. You know, you're mm-hmm. going to get good straight trees. You're going to get trees that are going to be able to grow at a at a good pace. You know, there's not going to be like watching paint dry. Right. And so if you if you can have kind of basically have that kind of a spacing, then you're doing good. You know, and mm-hmm. if you had even more space between them, you know, even better. But but that's at least the minimum that you want. Any closer than that, now you got to start thinning out your woods. You know. So when you start yeah. looking at the bigger trees to put on the ground. And I was, we, we had some logging done a couple of years ago, and I was actually shocked at the amount of really nice oak that went to the, chi- we, we call them chip yards up here, where they just grind them up and they make them into that particle board. I think it's uh, Louisiana Pacific. Or, but anyway, mm-hmm. um, I was shocked at the amount of oak because it was crooked. It was, there was a slight bend in it, and they said that's all it's good for. We, we, nobody wants it as a saw log. 
So if you're going to put trees on the ground for hinge cutting, cover, bedding areas, is that what you're looking for right away? If some of the trees you're going to leave standing, are they the straightest ones that may become timber down the road? Or is, that, is there a formula you have? Or how do you pick and choose? Yeah, so, so my number one formula is what the landowner wants. I mean, sure. <laughs> so, you okay. know, my first question to him is when I, when I see an issue like what this landowner had down south, you know, my, my first question is, are you interested in taking any timber value off of this property? And without mm -hmm. hesitation, the very first thing he said was, he says, I am not interested in timber at all. He says, I don't care if I, if I sell one tree off this property, I'm interested in habitat in, in, you know, not five years from now, but like, you know, this year. Mm -hmm. So sure. Sure. that's, that's all I needed to hear in that case. If, mm -hmm. but if you got somebody on the other side, maybe it's a younger landowner, you know, they're still got a lot of years ahead of them. They're, mm -hmm. they're interesting. They got a growing family. They could use some money down the road. You know, yes, mm -hmm. then I'll, what I'll do is I'll try and cut down some of the, the trees that are not going to be, going to be worth anything today or, you know, down the road. They're, they're crooked, multi-trunk, you know, they've got uh, something, something goofy went on them, you know. And so mm -hmm. if, if I have a choice to take down a nice straight tree or, or one that doesn't look like it's going to yield the type of monetary value that they could get, I'll, I'll always, mm -hmm. I'll always leave a nice one and, you know, go from there. So. You know, interesting. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it, it works out pretty good. So, um, you know, a lot of those big ones anyway, that I like to take down first to use as foundation trees and then drop smaller ones on top. A lot of the times, you know, those things are past their, their monetary prime and, mm -hmm. you know, they're still to get worm rot. And, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll find ants in the middle of them, you know, the centers are, are rotten out. So yeah, it's, um, it's not an exact science, but you know, uh, hinge cutting is not like building kitchen cabinets. I always say it's kind of yeah, down and dirty. You know? sure. mm -hmm. <laughs> so you said you've got rye already coming up in your food plot and you know, deer are hitting that. So did you have uh, you, you got white clover in that food plot as well. I mean, is that still that three split method? Yeah. The one behind the house that all the deer are in all the time that it, people that, that are on our Facebook page, see these pictures in our backyard. This is the food pot we're talking about. Um, right now it's the strip of white clover that really isn't much there, but there was a few deer in there. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's some green there. Cause I I've checked it through the winter and it doesn't, it never really turns Brown. It, it stays green. Um, but then the other two strips are both uh, white, or I'm sorry, our both winter rye that we planted this past fall, and we're going to do some, uh, we're going to do some no-till up there, um, because that's right above our pond that we swim in. We don't really want to till there anymore because it's it's amazing how uh, you you work the ground. Uh, six seven days later, we get a torrential rain, and the pond turns color. So um, we don't want to do that anymore. Um, mm. So yeah, it was all uh, we planted the. Uh, winter rye last fall and, and uh you know we've got some we had a 50 degree day here a couple of days ago the snow really took a beating we we're getting a lot of rain lately thank god it's not snow we'd have a foot of snow so um but uh yeah that we looked out the window tonight and there was uh, nine or ten of them and uh you know just like clockwork that green shows up and and, and here they come yeah yeah that's awesome yeah 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 so you know i i, I can't stress enough to, I mean, everybody we talk to, and we talk to folks all over the country that 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 are in the whitetail range. Every single person we talk to, I highly recommend at least 50% of their food plots get some sort of winter rye planting. And not only is it it's a great, yeah, it's not the greatest fall hunting. You know, there's there's some there's some other ones that are pretty attractive, but it's just a consistent workhorse. It, it's great in the fall. Uh, right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of states that are way ahead of us, Kentucky, Ohio, even southern Wisconsin, you know, down where you were at, are way ahead of us. But here in the UP, we had three feet of snow. We had snow cold weather since the end of October. And those deer, uh, you know, you think about 13, 14% crude protein that they're, that they're sticking down their throats right now. And, and those those that are, are going to drop fawns in, in, you know, what, six, seven weeks. And, and bucks are starting to think about putting antlers that first green winter rye is, is, is to me, this time of year is pretty impressive, you know? 
Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, mm-hmm. that winter rye is going to, uh, you know, get what, three, four, sometimes five feet tall in uh, in May, June, when those does are dropping their fawns. And it's, mm-hmm. it's a great place for them to drop their fawns. Um, mm-hmm. You know, coyotes don't normally spend a whole lot of time in, in that tall rye like that. Oh, the the thing with that is when we do our, when we mow the rye in July, um, you know, we, we usually have a clover growing underneath it. Every year we've been doing this, you know, strip, strip planting method where we have to go in, in July and, and mow the rye down. We send a four wheeler ahead of the tractor and it's like clockwork. Uh, we bump at least two fawns, sometimes up to four. And, you know, that's just a phenomenal place for the doe to hide the fawn and step out and eat in the food plot and then step back in to the rye. Do they, you know, do they live there all summer? Absolutely not. But that critical two or three or four weeks that the, doe, that the fawn does a lot of laying around and, and can't really get away from a predator, that's a phenomenal spot to put those fawns. Mm-hmm. In the summertime, when you mow that rye, how how low are you mowing it? Are you leaving it up a ways or or what? We're we're probably just mowing it uh, anywhere from a foot to you know ten inches to to sixteen inches. And the reason I do that is because we use we use a, a brush hog, okay. And if you put that brush hog right on the ground, you get that windrow out the back where it's you know the big clumpy anything underneath that's going to die. So I don't want that. Uh, to kill the red clover or whatever clover we've got coming b- along with the rye that we planted the previous fall. So I set the brush cutter as low as I can without getting that uh, that windrow. So, you know, mm-hmm. does that make sense? We're trying not to put all that duff in one area. We're trying to get it scattered out. And it's, it's probably not the safest thing to do. And I, you know, and I just tell folks when you do that, you got to be careful because those brush yeah. cutters are designed to be on the ground. And and we've got ours off the ground a little bit. You know, and, and actually, Randy might only be eight inches. I've never got the off and, and measured the height of the rye, but it's 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 not on the ground because of the situation of of all that that wind growing, all that green material. So, um, but it right. we cut it, and then, and then like two weeks later, that red clover pretty much takes over, and 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 it's a it's a pretty cool process to see. Yeah, and so you don't have a lot of weeds come fall when you're going to plant. No, your fall not food. much. Nope. You use that 10 to 12 inches of rye and clover to uh, roll over your fall plantings, and uh, it, it acts as a mulch. Right, right. We set the tiller uh, at about one inch, and all I'm doing is scratching the surface. That's all we're doing because we're following it with brassicas, and they don't need to be in the ground very deep. And there's a lot of stuff laying on top of the ground, rye and red clover, and then we, we put our brassicas right in there, and it, 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 keeps the, it keeps the soil pretty damp. It doesn't dry out, and it, it does a really nice job. But, but that rye, you know, we use it three out of the four, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter. We use it just about all year long for, for mm-hmm. in some sort of fashion for the deer. Okay. Now, John, have, um, have you ever just tried to just broadcast your brassicas right into that uh, standing rye and clover, which is you know pretty much at the end of its life cycle when you're planting your fall plot. I've tried it, Randy, and 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 the rye is at the end of the of its life cycle, but the red clover is a biannual clover, two year clover, and mm-hmm. depending on how thick you plant it and stuff, that stuff can take off pretty fast. And I just don't think the the brassica is going to make it. I've tried mm-hmm. many times trying to plant stuff into growing clover, and it man, it just that clover grows so fast that, you know, those little tiny plants just don't have a chance to get any sunlight. That's what I saw okay. in my, in my, in my trials. So what, what if you use crimson clover in the previous fall instead of uh, the, the, the biannual red clover? Up here, it might winter kill. It's really hit and miss up here because, mm. uh, you know, we did knock on wood. This winter hasn't been bad up here. I mean, we had a couple of, you know, 10 below zero nights but three, four feet of snow. We had a really bad ice storm, but two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, the crimson clover all winter killed. So you're not going to get that, let's the say the following benefit. spring. Yeah, the rye, the rye's coming back and that crimson clover, I found up here isn't going to make it. But now let's say you get south of, say, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or Lansing, or you know, into Iowa, where they might not have as cold weather, 
that crimson clover might make it and you know then you you might be able to do that but you know depend doesn't matter what clover it is i've just not found that put putting seed down i mean i've tried you know trying to roll it i've tried to spray it i've tried a lot of stuff and, and a growing clovers to, in from what i found is just really tough to get that really nice food plot to follow it just because they're it, it's just it's grown so fast you know unless you mm-hmm. go physically and kill it and then in my opinion if you're going to do that i'll just i'll just hit it once with a tiller okay so I, i'm seeing that the, you know there's a lot of guys that are using some of these uh what they call you know some of these clover plow downs different varieties of clover in there so uh, are you doing anything like that as well to um kind of match what some of these other companies are trying to do We've always used our crimson as a plow down. We've used our red as a plow down. Uh, we don't sell it. But I'm sure we could. We use, we really like to use Versine clover, which is an annual uh, for a spring planting following brassicas. Now, one of the things that we don't do, which a lot of other companies do, and I just shake my head at it, uh, they'll put all that into one big bag and call it a, you know, their super clover blend whatever they'll put mm-hmm. you know, a couple of white maybe some annual bursim some annual crimson and some red and you know maybe a little alfalfa or whatever but the problem is is that let's say you've got 20 percent bursim clover again it's an annual if you plant it in the spring it lasts all year then it dies if you plant it in the fall it's going to die uh crimson clover may or may not make it through the winter but it's an annual so the thought process on my part is this why are you going to put or buy a clover blend let's say buy six pounds of clover and only three pounds is going to make it i i just don't understand that i'm I'm not i i think there's a place for a bursine clover i really do i think there's a place for crimson i definitely think there's a place for red and i i know there's a place for white ladino clovers do i think they belong belong all together absolutely not half of those clovers aren't going to make it after one or two years and you're right. going to have to you're going to have to frost seed more clover the following i guess maybe that's their game plan just keep selling them clover and and they'll <laughs> buy more they'll buy more because half of it's going to die anyway <laughs> you know i don't do that our, our clover blends are pure white ladino clovers that are you know they'll go five six seven years and you, you might have to frost seed once or twice but uh, I, I think there's a place for all these different type of clovers, but to throw them all in one big bag and put a put a picture of a buck on it, I, I think that's just wrong. You know, anybody that thinks that's right, I'll argue with him all day. But those are the facts. Those are annual clovers. They are not going to make it the following year, and um, we just don't do that. Right. So, you know, just in case guys are wondering, you know, I think the general consensus out there, opinion, is that clovers are perennials. You plant it once and it comes up and it'll grow, uh, you know, and you're probably good for a few few to five years or something like that. But, you know, the annual clovers, in case anybody's wondering, basically the three main annual clovers is your, your crimson clover, your bursine clover, and then you've got your biannual uh, red clover, medium red. And everything else is basically your perennial. So, um, yeah, just so no one, no one is confused. And generally, like the, the crimson clover, the seed's a little bit bigger because it's an annual. Mm-hmm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to germinate a little quicker. It's going to pop out of the ground a little faster because it's an annual. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, those are just some things that, you know, maybe a listener should just keep in mind when they're looking at the, you know, the labels on the bags on, as to what clover they're actually buying. Yeah, if you're buying a clover blend with bursim in it, do yourself a, pay, a favor, set the bag down and go find something without bursim clover in it. I there's a like I said, Randy, I love bursim clover that you know we we drop it down in the spring with oats and peas and and some other stuff because it's a, it is a fast grower, it explodes out of the ground. Okay. Yeah. But it the reason I like it is because uh, you you're, you're not going to be dealing with it you know, because that's where like our fall forage is going to go, or maybe we're going to follow that with some, some more brassicas or sugar beets or whatever, but it's a great plow down. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and and the thing with crimson clover, crimson clover, you may be able to get it to last for a few years, but you have to let it go to seed. Well, by the time crimson goes to seed, your white clover might've had to been mowed twice already, you know? Right. 
So, you know, it just, there's a place for each one of those clovers, but like I said, they don't belong together, in my opinion, in the same bag together. And we've been selling clover for uh, eight or nine years now, and I've never once put all that stuff together just for that simple reason that they just don't belong together in the same mix, in my opinion. And, and I'll tell you what, there's a lot of guys I've talked to that, that are in this industry that will agree with me. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. You know, I think a lot of guys down south, that you know, they don't have that issue of uh, like a crimson, you know, freezing out over the wintertime. No. And, uh, right, right. You know, it, it's, uh, I really like that blend of, uh, you know, winter rye, you know, doing your fall forage and then, mm-hmm. you know, with, the, with crimson and, um, mm-hmm. and, and, some, and some radishes. And then, you know, the next spring, you got that rye coming back, you got the crimson coming back. And, uh, you know, th- then they'll, they'll mature if you, if you don't mow it or spray it. Uh, until after the seed matures, well, then shoot, they'll mm-hmm. just reseed themselves. It's a very good weed suppressor. You, you're not fighting weeds the whole time. And and if you leave it a little tall in the fall when you plant your next fall uh, plantings, you know, it acts as a good mulch if you don't want to till. So a lot of benefits right. to doing that. You know, the, the red clover up here survives the winter. That's the component in our we use with the fall forage, okay? And the reason we use red is because it nine, most of the time it doesn't freeze out. Now, if we were doing this mix, this rotation down in, say, Kentucky, southern Ohio, you know, down through that region, you could use crimson instead of red knowing it's coming back the following spring. I can't, I can't guarantee that up here. I, I just can't. So that's why... I'll use crimson and say like our kill plots, you know, we'll do our little, a little eighth acre kill plot. We'll use our two favorite mixes are either our seclusion mix, clover, you know, the clover chicory mix, or we'll do the fall forage with the crimson clover. And the reason I like the crimson clover is because it, because it grows so fast. It is a little bit, it can take a few frosts, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be there the following spring. You know, so I'm not going right. to have to go in and mow it and everything. Um, but I really like crimson in, in, in a kill plot, you know. So now if I was mm-hmm. planting in the fall a kill plot and I wanted a clover component, I certainly wouldn't use the white clover unless I was trying to establish it because it's slow growing, you know. So like I said, Randy, there's a time and a place for each one of those clovers. And I just, you know, all together, man, I just kind of shake my head at that. Yeah. So Guys that have a really nice stand of white clover, you know, they want to plant mm-hmm. it once and be done with it. They just maybe want to mow it a couple, three times a year. But if, if they're really struggling with weeds, maybe some grasses and whatnot, um, have you ever used IMOX to control that? Honestly, I'm not a big fan of, of spraying my food plots um, once I have them established. It's just, that's just me. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of guys like that. Uh, but, yes, I've used IMOX, I think, twice behind the house here where we were trying to establish and we had a little bit of a pigweed issue. The one thing I did notice is that it, it seemed the, the, the clover, it didn't kill it, but the clover for about a week didn't seem to be enjoying life too much. It kind of looked a little wilty and, and stuff, but it bounced back. Um, and it took care of the grass. It took care of um, most of the broadleafs. Um, you know, it, it was, it was all, also an experiment because we have customers, you know, on a daily basis, hey, what do I spray with? What do I, you know, how do we take care of these clover plots? And, and you know, before I give out advice, I'd, I want to make sure this is, yeah, this is what we use and this is how it worked for us. So, yes, I've used IMOX and it, and it seems to work fairly well. Same thing with uh, Clothodium uh, for grass. Um, but by and large, you know, if, if you do, I, I really like my favorite way to, to establish a clover plot is to plant it in the fall with rye and oats. And then the following spring, you just have to mow the rye a couple of times. And, and, you know, by June, you're looking at, in, in our results, we're looking at like a 99% weed-free clover plot. So I, I really like that. But the key to a, a good weed, uh, weed-free clover plot is really, and it's like any other food plot, Randy, it's make sure you got a clean seed bed when you start. And, and a good soil test. <laughs> yeah, good soil test. Yeah, we've we've talked a lot of guys this year out of planting clover already, just because you're looking at that organic matter. I, we, in fact, I talked to a gentleman this uh, this afternoon from, uh, gosh, I think he was in Houghton Lake, uh, you know, the northern part of Lower Michigan, sandy soil, 0.9 percent organic matter, you know, 5.6 pH, and he wanted to put clover in, and I said, sir, 
I'll sell you the clover, but I'm telling you right now, I don't, I really don't think it's going to grow very well for you. So, uh, you know, he's going to do the buckwheat rye rotation, maybe some soil builder for a couple of years. And I said, when you get these numbers here, we can probably look at clover then. So, um, you know, there's a, there's just certain soils that won't take a good clover plot. Yeah. Well, Hey John, I'm glad you didn't recommend he plant brassicas. <laughs> um, I've it, heard some guys, uh, you know, recommend that in sandy areas. I just kind of shake yeah, my head, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. We, we were, like, yeah, that's kind of funny because I, I was talking through uh, email with a gentleman that had a 1,400 square foot plot in, I, I want to say it was West Virginia, uh, mountain area. So when I think of the mountain areas, I'm, I'm not thinking the soils, you know, this black fertile Iowa or Illinois soil. So I'm fearing the worst. But then when he said 1,400 feet, I'm sorry, 14 hundred square foot plot which i'm thinking is what a, a 20th of an acre 15th of yeah. an acre yeah mm -hmm. so anyway he said my neighbor wants me to plant radishes and i said well <laughs> i you know I, I i probably wouldn't do that and here's why and, and i do believe he's going to do just straight rye but there there's rye again you know randy it's it'll grow on just about anything and in a small plot like that it can keep up to browse pressure so yeah time and a place for every everything but you know you, you can't plant radishes where they're going to get eaten to the ground in a matter of three days yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. yeah so well man john i could talk about food plants and all this stuff all night long i'm telling you what your, your seed must just be flying out the door about now huh yeah we're we're having some great weeks uh i'm um with all the craziness that's going on in this country i'm kind of curious to see how things are going to do uh you know the next uh you know next eight to ten weeks so i just kind of keep my eye on things but so far so good things have been going well and uh looking forward to talking to you again randy yeah i, I think there's one thing you can count on john guys that are normally food plots there ain't no way that uh you know some coronavirus is going to stop them from ordering seed and planting their food plots for 2020. <laughs> Well, we that's true. We've talked to a lot of people that uh, that have some time off and they're in the woods and starting to plant. So, uh, you know, just stay safe and uh, hopefully we get this thing over with pretty quickly. That's right. You know, there's one thing about being out in the woods this time of year. It's pretty hard to contract the virus when you're uh, working in the woods, right? For sure. All right, John. Hey, we'll catch up with you again next time and um, hopefully you can keep up with them uh, seed orders. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you next time, John. Sounds good, Randy. Have a great night. See ya.